aminotransferases will allow amino acids to be added into the citric acid cycle or in, as pyruvate or acetyl-CoA. So what happens is the amino acid will have the amine group either move to aspartate or to glutamate and uh, then it can move, the carbon skeleton can move into the citric acid cycle. Now there's glucogenic amino acids and there's ketogenic. And so glutogenic means that they come into the citric acid cycle after the one of the two carbo uh, decarboxylations. So if you add an amino acid into the citric acid cycle over here, then it'll lose two carbons and it won't be able to add to gluconeogenesis. But if you put it in after, at least after that first decarboxylation, it will be able to provide some carbons to gluconeogenesis. And so it can go back up and uh, add to glucose. Uh, if an amino acid comes in, especially as acetyl-CoA, then all of the uh, CO, so Acetyl-CoA is two carbon groups, so if an amino acid comes in and gets converted into this two-carbon acetyl-CoA, it'll lose both of those carbons in the citric acid cycle, and although it'll add energy to the cell, it won't be able to add any carbons to go back to glucose. Now, there's only two amino acids that are strictly uh, ketogenic. That's leucine and lysine. The rest of these can either be ketogenic or glucogenic amino acids depending on where they move in. So they have multiple pathways to move into the citric acid cycle. When an amino acid is used in the citric acid cycle or in gluconeogenesis, then you have uh, an amino group that's taken off of the amino acid. So you get nitrogen. And that nitrogenous uh, component is typically used, it's excreted from the body because too much nitrogen in the body and it's harmful. So up here we have the different components of nitrogenous waste and where they come from. So ammonia, for example, can come from both proteins and purines, so it's both. Urea comes from only proteins and uric acid comes from only purines. And so you can see the double ring structure that's typical of, a, of the uh, look and feel of a, a nucleotide, especially a purine. Now all three of these are nitrogenous weight. This is how we get rid of nitrogen in our body. Ammonia is kept at really low levels in our body because it's harmful to our brain. It's a neurotoxin. And so usually between 30 and 60 uh, micromolar is the highest you'll get of an ammonia. And in the body, it's actually the ammonium ion because the pKa of ammonia is about 9. So if you have a pKa of 9 and our pH in our and our serum is about 7.35, then you're going to have an, a hydrogen atom added to that, and it's going to be the ammonium ion. Amino acids are broken down in all the tissues in our body. Every cell, every uh, organelle, basically, will be uh, breaking down amino acids in order to control enzymatic pathways. And the first step in breaking that down is the removal of the nitrogen. And so uh, we have a nitrogen. This is a waste product and we need to get rid of it. And the primary mechanism for getting rid of that nitrogen is the urea cycle. And so just like it says here, the urea cycle enzymes are primarily expressed in the liver. There are some expressed in the intestines, but uh, it's almost insignificant. The liver is what we think of when we think of the urea cycle. And so I think I said just a few seconds ago that ammonia was kept at levels of 30 to 60 micromolar. It's millimolar. But uh, regardless of the fact, it's kept at a low concentration because um, it's toxic. And so usually if you're wanting to transport a nitrogen component in the body, you'll transport it on an amino acid, either glutamine or alanine. And the reason, because, for example, glutamine, if you start out with, alpha ketoglutarate, let me draw this here, alpha ketoglutarate. If you add a nit an NH3 to that, you get glutamate. And then if you add another NH3 to that, you get glutamine. 
And so glutamine is basically a carrier of two nitrogen components just on one amino acid. And so it makes it great for uh, nitrogen transfer. And the other thing is that glutamine and alanine are both very neutral, and so they don't really affect the pH of the blood. They don't affect, um, or they're, they're not going to change the pH of the blood. So they're very good carriers of, uh, of amine groups through the serum. So from peripheral tissue to either glutamine can carry it to the kidneys, glutamine can carry it to the intestines, or glutamine and alanine can carry it to the liver for the urea cycle. The typical steps to take the nitrogen off of amino acid uh, allows it to be used for either the production of glucose or for use in electron uh, transfers in the TCA cycle to be used for energy. And so the way that happens is an amino transferase will take the amino group off of an amino acid and transfer it to alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha-ketoglutarate is an alpha-keto acid. Uh, so you use up an alpha-keto acid and you produce a different alpha-keto acid. Now when you transfer the amine group to alpha-ketoglutarate, alpha uh, alpha it forms glutamate. So the shuffling of an amine group is called transamination. And so you get the, the breakdown of the word is... Uh, you get the trans, you're transferring something, amine, so you're transferring an amine, so transamination. Now in this particular slide, alanine is used as an example. So alanine will transfer its amine group to uh, alpha-ketoglutarate with the ALT, alanine amino transferase, or sometimes called alanine transaminase. So and so many of these enzymes will have multiple names, and that's if you know what the names are, it's really easy to figure out what it does and where it's acting at. It's important to note, though, that even though alanine is listed here, it's not al alanine isn't the only amino acid that can be used to uh, in a transamination reaction. So any amino acid, and then glutamate, will be the ultimate carrier of the nitrogenous group. So a closer look at the transamination reaction, it has to have a prosthetic group of vitamin B6. It's also known as pyridoxal phosphate. So you get alanine and alpha-ketoglutarate, and in this reversible reaction with pyridoxal phosphate as the uh, prosthetic group, you can produce pyruvate and glutamate. Now the, the reversibility of this depends on the relative abundance of each of these uh, substrates. So um, typically we're going from alanine and alpha-ketoglutarate to pyruvate and glutamate. But because the reaction is reversible, different labs are going to have a different name for the enzyme. So for the most part, uh, it's referred to as alanine aminotransferase or alanine transaminase. So one of the combination of this ALT, or in some labs it's called serum glutamic pyruvic transaminase, and so SGPT. And so depending, so uh, if you're calling it ALT, it's you're basically saying, hey, alanine's going into this and transferring an amino group. If you're calling it SGPT, you're saying glutamate and pyruvate are going to this and transferring uh, an amino group. And so depending on which way the reaction's going, and depending on what lab you're getting your information from, it, the enzyme could be either one of these. But if you know what the, each of these names are, then you know what's going into the reaction, and you know what's uh, typically coming out of the reaction. So two common transaminases would be ALT and AST, so for alanine or aspartate. And like I said, all of these pretty much have two different names, serum glutamic oxaloacetic transaminase, and so glutamate or an oxaloacetate going in, or you could call it aspartate amino transferase, so aspartate going in. Now both of these reactions happen inside the liver, um, and so both of these enzymes are used in the uh, liver function test. I'm going to write that in here, the liver function test. And actually, let me make this a little bit wider. So liver function test. And this is sort of a misnomer because you're not testing the 
function of the liver when you do this test. You're testing the dysfunction of the liver. So whenever you're testing for these enzymes, what you're doing is you're saying, this enzyme that should be inside the liver and not in the blood, is it in the blood? And if it is, you're showing that the liver cells are either dying or something's wrong with them where these are spilling out of the, the, the dying cells of the liver. And so higher amounts of those show a dysfunction in the liver. Now actually... ALT is a better enzyme marker for liver function than AST because ALT is primarily produced in the liver. We're actually getting ready to, the next slide is going to show that. So neither one, ALT and AST, neither one are expressed only in, a, in the liver, but ALT is highest levels in the liver. So liver cells start dying, ALT spilling into the blood. The next highest would be the kidney, then the heart, and then the skeletal muscles. And, and it goes on down the line where erythrocytes have a pretty low uh, amount of ALT, but they still have some. Then AST, its highest levels are in the heart. And actually before, uh, before the troponin test was, uh, was done, AST was the primary test used to check for heart attacks. But then after the heart, the next thing, it's uh, the next highest amount is found in the liver and then in skeletal muscles. So it's, uh, it's a very nonspecific uh, enzyme marker. So as it says down here, it's a nonspecific for tissue damage in general, whereas ALT is highest levels in the liver and makes it an early marker for liver damage. All right, so that's about it for this particular video. Next video, we're going to go into the details of the urea cycle. And so it's going to take a little while, and I might break it down into two videos. I don't know.